Hello there, everyone. It's Natalie. I'm the one who plays the organ and the piano and all kinds of funny instruments. You've come just in time. I was about to do some reading. I'm just going to pour myself a little bit of tea. How are you doing today? I hope you're all doing fine. All right. So, you all know that I play music. Um, and when I was in college, I studied with these two lovely people. But also, when I was in college, I read a lot. I was an English major, and my favorite writer of all time is an Irish man named Oscar Wilde. Um, I can hardly go a day without mentioning him. This is Oscar Wilde. <laughs> Today, I'm going to read you one of my favorite stories by Oscar Wilde. It's called The Happy Prince, and it was written in 1888, which is more than 100 years ago. Um, I have a copy of his fairy tales. Do you guys know what a fairy tale is? A fairy tale is a story that involves magical people or creatures or unexpected things. So, this is from a collection of his fairy tales called The Happy Prince and Other Fairy Tales. Um, and my friend gave me this book in high school, so we're going to read from it today. This is a very beautiful story. I hope you enjoy it. Here is the first picture. There may only be one picture, but you can see the town magistrate, the poor little girl, and a bird. You're about to start the happy prince. High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the happy prince. He was gilded all over with thin leaves of fine gold, for he had eyes of two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed in his sword hilt. He was very much admired indeed. He is as beautiful as a weathercock, remarked one of the town councillors, who wished to gain a reputation for having artistic tastes. Only not quite so useful, he added, fearing lest people should think him unpractical, which he really was not. Why can't you be like the happy prince? asked a sensible mother of her little boy who was crying for the moon. The happy prince never dreams of crying for anything. I am glad there is someone in the world who is quite happy, muttered a disappointed man as he gazed at the wonderful statue. He looks just like an angel, said the charity children as they came out of the cathedral in their bright scarlet cloaks and their clean white pinafores. How do you know, said a mathematical professor. You have never seen one. Ah, but we have in our dreams, answered the children. And the mathematical master frowned and looked very severe, for he did not approve of children dreaming. One night, there flew over the city a little swallow. That's the bird in the picture, right there, the little swallow. His friends had gone away to Egypt six weeks before, but he had stayed behind, for he was in love with the most beautiful reed. He had met her early in the spring as he was flying down the river after a big yellow moth and had been so attracted by her slender waist that he had stopped to talk to her. Do you all know what a reed is? A reed is a piece of grass down by a marsh or a bog or a pond. Shall I love you? said the swallow, who liked to come to the point at once, and the reed made him a low bow. So he flew around and around her, touching the water with his wings and making silver ripples. This was his courtship, and it lasted all through the summer. It is a ridiculous attachment, twittered the other swallows. She has no money and far too many relations. And indeed, the river was quite full of reeds. Then, when the autumn came, they all flew away. That is, the birds flew away. After they had gone, he felt a little lonely and began to tire of his lady love. She has no conversation, he said, and I am afraid that she is a coquette. That means... She's not very true, for she is always flirting with the wind. And certainly, whenever the wind blew, the reed made the most graceful curtsies. I admit that she is domestic, he continued, but I love traveling, and so my wife, consequently, should love traveling also. Will you come away with me? He finally said to her, but the reed shook her head. She was so attached to her home. You have been trifling with me, he cried. I am off to the pyramids. Goodbye. And he flew away. All day long he flew, and all at night time he arrived at the city. Where shall I put up? 
he said. I hope the town has made preparations. Then he saw the statue on the tall column. I will put up there, he cried. It is a fine position, with plenty of fresh air. So he alighted just between the feet of the happy prince. I have a golden bedroom, he said softly to himself as he looked around and prepared to go to sleep. But just as he was putting his head under his wing, a large drop of water fell on him. What a curious thing, he cried. There is not a single cloud in the sky. The stars are quite clear and bright, and yet it is raining. The climate in the north of Europe is really dreadful. The reed used to like the rain, but that was merely her selfishness. Then another drop fell. What is the use of a statue if it cannot keep the rain off, he said. I must look for a good chimney pot. And he determined to fly away. But before he had opened his wings, a third drop fell, and he looked up and saw, ah, what did he see? The eyes of the happy prince were filled with tears, and tears were running down his golden cheeks. His face was so beautiful in the moonlight that the little swallow was filled with pity. Who are you? he said. I am the happy prince. Why are you weeping then? asked the swallow. You have quite drenched me. When I was alive, I had a human heart, answered the statue. I did not know what fears were, for I lived in the palace of San Suchi, where sorrow is not allowed to enter. In the daytime, I played with my companions in the garden, and in the evening, I led the dance in the great hall. Round the garden ran a very lofty wall, but I never cared to ask what lay beyond it. Everything about me was so beautiful. My courtiers called me the happy prince, and happy indeed I was, if pleasure be happiness. So I lived, and so I died. And now that I am dead, they have set me up here so high that I can see all the ugliness and all the misery of my city. And the thought, and though my heart is made of lead, yet I cannot choose but weep. What? Is he not of solid gold? The swallow said to himself. He was too polite to make any personal remarks out loud. Far away, continued the statue in a low musical voice. Far away in a little street, there is a poor house. One of the windows is open and through it I can see a woman seated at a table. Her face is thin and worn and she has coarse red hands all pricked by the needle, for she is a seamstress. A seamstress is somebody who makes dresses and clothes. She is embroidering a passion flower on a stained gown, satin gown for the loveliest of the queen's maids of honor to wear at the next court ball. In a bed in the corner is, in the room is her little boy lying ill. He has a fever and is asking for oranges. His mother has nothing to give him but river water, so he is crying. Swallow, swallow, little swallow. Will you not bring the red ruby out of my sword hilt? My feet are fastened to this pedestal and I cannot move. I am waited for in Egypt, said the little swallow. My friends are flying up and down the Nile and take, taking, talking to the large lotus flowers. Soon they will go to sleep in the tomb of the great king. The king is there himself and is painted in his painted coffin. He is wrapped in yellow linen and embalmed with spices. Round his neck is a chain of pale jade green and his hands are like withered leaves. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay for me for one night and be my messenger? The boy is so thirsty and the mother is so sad. I do not think I like boys, answered the swallow. Last summer, when I was staying on the river, there were two rude boys, the miller's sons, who were always throwing stones at me. They never hit me, of course. We swallows fly far too well for that. And besides, I come of a family famous for its agility. But still, I think it was a mark of disrespect. But the happy prince looked so sad that the little sw swallow was sorry. It is very cold here, he said, but I will stay for you with you for one night and be your messenger. Thank you, little swallow, said the prince. So the swallow picked out the great ruby from the prince's sword and flew away with it in his beak over the roofs of the town. He passed by the cathedral tower where all the white marble angels were sculptured. He passed by the palace and heard the sounds of dancing. A beautiful girl came out on the balcony with her lover. How wonderful the stars are, he said to her, and how wonderful is the power of love. I hope my dress will be ready in time for the state ball, she answered. We have ordered passion flowers to be embroidered on it, but the seamstresses are so lazy. He passed over the river and saw the lanterns hanging to the masts of the ships. He passed over the ghetto and saw the old Jews bargaining with each other and weighing out money on copper scales. And at last he came to the poor house and looked in. 
The boy was tossing feverishly on his bed, and the mother had fallen asleep, so she was so tired. In he hopped and laid the great ruby on the table beside the woman's thimble. He flew gently around the bed, fanning the boy's forehead with his wings. How cool I feel, said the boy. I must be getting better. And he sank into delicious slumber. Then the swallow flew back to the happy prince and told him what he had done. It is curious, he remarked, but I feel quite warm now, although it is so cold. That is because you have done a good action, said the prince. And the little swallow began to think, and then he fell asleep. Thinking always made him sleepy. When the day broke, he flew down to the river and had a bath. What a remarkable phenomenon, said the professor of ornithology, that is the study of birds, said the professor of birds as he was passing over the bridge. A swallow in winter. And he wrote a long letter about it to the local newspaper. Everyone quoted it. It was so full of so many words that they could not understand. Tonight I go to Egypt, said the swallow as he was in high spirits at the prospect. He visited all of the public monuments and sat a long time on top of the church steeple. Wherever he went, the sparrows chirped and said to each other, what a distinguished stranger. So he enjoyed himself very much. When the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. Have you any commissions for Egypt? He cried. I am just starting. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? I am waited for in Egypt, answered the swallow. Tomorrow my friends will fly up to the second cataract. The river horse crouches there among the bulrushes. That's the reeds, the grass. And on a great granite throne sits the god Memnon. All night long he watches the stars, and when the morning star shines, he utters out one cry of joy, and then he is silent. At noon, the yellow lions come down to the water's edge and drink. They have eyes like green barrels, and their roar is louder than the roar of the cataract. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Far away across the city, I see a young man in a garret. He is leaning over a desk covered with papers, and in tumbler by his sides, there is a bunch of withered violets. His hair is brown and crisp, and his lips are red as pomegranate, and he has large, dreamy eyes. He is trying to finish a play for the director of the theatre, but he is too cold to write any more. There is no fire in his grate, and his hunger has made him faint. I will wait with you one more night longer, said the swallow, who really had a good heart. Shall I take him another ruby? Alas, I have no ruby now, said the prince. My eyes are all that I have left. They are made of rare sapphires, which were brought out of India a thousand years ago. Pluck one of them out and take it to him. He will sell it to the jeweler and buy firewood and finish his play. Dear Prince, said the swallow, I can't do that. And he began to weep. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince, do as I command you. So the swallow plucked out the prince's eye and flew away to the student's garret. It was easy enough to get in as there was a hole in the roof. Through this he darted and came into the room. The young man had his head buried in his hands, so he did not hear the flutter of the bird's wings. And when he looked up, he found a beautiful sapphire lying on the withered violets. I'm beginning to be appreciated, he said. This is from some great admirer. Now I can finish my play. And he looked quite happy. The next day, the swallow flew down to the harbor. He sat on the mast of a large vessel and watched the sailors hauling big chests out of the hold with ropes. Heave ahoy, they shouted as the chest came in. I am going to Egypt, cried the swallow, but nobody minded. And when the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. I am coming to bid you goodbye, he cried. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? It is winter, answered the swallow, and the chill snow will soon be here. In Egypt, the sun is warm on the green palm trees. The crocodiles lie in the mud and look lazily about them. My companions are building a nest in the temple of Baalbek, and the pink and white doves are watching them and cooing to each other. Dear prince, I must leave you. But I will never forget you, and next spring I will bring you back two beautiful jewels in the place of the ones you have given away. The ruby shall be redder than a rose, and the sapphire shall be as blue as the great sea. In the square below, said the happy prince, there stands a little match girl. She has let her matches fall in the gutter, and they are all spoiled. Back at this time in history, people would sell matches um, very cheaply to try and bring money home. And they were called match girls. Her father will beat her if she does not bring home some money, and she and she is crying. She has no shoes or stockings, and her little head is bare. 
pluck out my other eye and give it to her, and her father will not beat her. I will stay with you one night longer, said the swallow, but I cannot pluck out your eye. You would be quite blind then. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince, do as I command you. So he plucked out the prince's other eye and darted down with it. He stooped past the masked girl and slipped the little jewel into the palm of her hand. What a lovely bit of glass, cried the little girl as she ran home, laughing. Then the swallow came back to the prince. You are blind now, he said. I will stay with you always. No, little swallow, said the poor prince. You must go to Egypt. I will stay with you always, said the swallow, and he slept at the prince's feet. All the next day, he sat on the prince's shoulder and told him stories of what he had seen in the strange land. He told him of the red ibises who stand in long rows on the banks of the Nile and catch goldfish in their beaks. Ibises are kinds of birds. Of the sphinx who is as old as the world itself. Of the merchants who walk slowly by the sides of their camels and carry amber beads in their hands. The king of the mountains of the moon who is as black as ebony and worships as a large crystal of the great snake that sleeps in the palm tree and his twenty priests to feed him with honey cakes, and of the pygmies who sail over a big lake on the large flat leaves and are always at war with the butterflies. Doesn't that sound fantastic? Dear little swallow, said the prince, you tell me of marvelous things, more marvelous than anything is the suffering of men and women. There is no mystery so great as misery. Fly over the city, my little swallow, and tell me what you see there. So the great swallow flew over the city and saw the rich making merry in their beautiful homes while the beggars were sitting at the gates. He flew into dark lanes and saw the white faces of starving children looking out listlessly at the black streets. Under the archway of a bridge, two little boys were lying in one another's arms to try and keep themselves warm. How hungry we are, they said. You must not lie there, shouted a watchman, and they wandered out into the rain. Then he flew back and told the prince what he had seen. I am covered with fine gold, said the prince. You must take it off, leaf by leaf, and give it to my poor. The living always think that gold can make them happy. Leaf after leaf of fine gold, the swallow picked off, till the happy prince looked quite dull and grey. Leaf after leaf of fine gold he brought to the poor, and the children's faces grew rosier, and they laughed and played games in the streets. We have bread now, they cry. When the snow came, and after the snow and the frost came, the streets looked as if they were made of silver and they were so bright and glistening. Long icicles like crystal daggers hung down from the caves of the houses. Everybody went about in furs, and the little boys wore scarlet caps and skated on the ice. The poor little swallow grew colder and colder, but he would not leave the prince. He loved him too well. He picked up crumbs outside the baker's door when the baker was not looking. He tried to keep himself warm by flapping his wings, but at last he knew that he was going to die. He had just enough strength to fly up to the prince's shoulder once more. Goodbye, dear prince, he murmured. Will you let me kiss your hand? I am glad that you are going to Egypt at last, little swallow, said the prince. You have stayed too long here, but you must kiss me on the lips, for I love you. It is not to Egypt that I am going, said the swallow. I am going to the house of death. Death is the brother of sleep, is he not? And he kissed the happy prince on the lips and fell down dead at his feet. At that moment, a curious crack sounded inside of the statue, as if something had broken. The fact is that the leaden heart had simply snapped right in two. It certainly was a dreadfully hard frost. Early the next morning, the mayor was walking in the square below with the company of the town councillors. As they passed the column, they looked up at the statue. Dear me, how shabby the pappy prince looks, they said. How shabby indeed, cried the town councillors, who had always agreed with the mirror, and they went up to, the, to look at it. The ruby has fallen out of his sword, his eyes are gone, and he is golden no longer, said the mirror. In fact, he looks little better than a beggar. Little better than a beggar, said the town councillors. And here is actually a dead bird at his feet, continued the mayor. We must really issue a proclamation that birds are not allowed to die here. And the town clerk made a note of it in the suggestion. 
So they pulled down the statue of the happy prince. As he is no longer beautiful, he is no longer useful, said the art professor at the university. Then they melted down the statue in a furnace, and the mayor held a meeting of the corporation to decide what was to be done with the metal. We must have another statue, of course, he said, and it shall be a statue of myself. Of myself, said each of the town councillors, and they quarrelled. At last, when, <laughs> when at last I heard them, they were quarrelling still. What a strange thing said the overseer of the workmen at the foundry. This broken lead heart will not melt into the furnace. We must throw it away. So they threw it on a dust heap where the dead swallow was also lying. Bring me the two most precious things in the city, said God to one of his angels. And the angel brought him the leaden heart and the dead bird. You have rightly chosen, said God. For in my garden of paradise, this little bird shall sing forevermore. And in my city of gold, the happy prince shall praise me 